in the studio with me are two of Canada's greatest crime reporters, and I've worked with both of these gentlemen, uh, you, you know, side by side or in competition for many, many years. On, on my left, I've got Ian Robertson, my colleague and good friend from the Toronto Sun, and on my right, I've got Cal Miller, who's uh, formerly of the Toronto Sun and many, many years at the Toronto Star and recently retired. And together, these uh, these guys put together a book, and it's called How a Colonel Became a Killer. I probably don't need to tell you uh, what it's about. Uh, I've read uh, bits and pieces of it. I haven't got my own copy, but I've stolen Ian's a couple times off his desk. And it's, it's very, very good, and it's, it's an interesting read. As someone who covered that story right from the very first moment that it it came down. I, it's one of these ones you just can't put down. 416-872-1010 is the call if you want to uh, call in and talk to these gentlemen about the Russell Williams case. And uh, if you're out of town, one 514 There's many people down in Belleville, Trenton, Tweed that may want to uh, join in here. Start Talk 8255 on your cell and text 71010, of course. Uh, let's start, uh, gentlemen, uh, with Cal. This book, uh, f- before we get into what it's about, what what was the genesis? Why did you decide to do this book? Well, there were an awful lot of unanswered questions, even after the case was wrapped up in the courts. And uh, we thought it was necessary to uh, basically uh, bring the story, the untold story, of the uh, murders and the various crimes that he committed through the 29-month period. And so when you got into it, what did you see that was different than what we were seeing in the media? Well, uh, really, the, the unanswered questions were regarding the investigation itself and uh, the activities that Williams uh, uh, performed. Uh, the media really couldn't get into the detail of the crimes, particularly the break-ins. There was heavy concentrations on the murder, the two murders, and there was also some uh, coverage of the uh, sexual assaults. But they hadn't done an in-depth look, a critical look, uh, at really what happened during those 873 days that Williams was on his crime spree. And so what are some of the things that you noticed in the trends and the the different things in these break-ins? Really, it was his escalation. Um, He was uh, looking to uh, commit the perfect crime, uh, things he was doing to uh, throw the police off. Uh, One of the most critical things we determined was that uh, until he was actually arrested following his confession, you really wouldn't find a point where uh, the police could say he was the suspect, he's the person responsible. It was a definite buildup through the investigation. Ian, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, you, You know, you've worked with Cal, against Cal mostly in your career, and there you are working with him. What was your part in this book? Well, one of the one of the biggest contributions I had, uh, including being Cal's friend, and uh, you're right, we we I guess you might call it we worked against each other, but uh, uh, I always respected Cal's ability as a crime reporter, and we became friends uh, through this and trusted. And when he when he asked me to take uh, a part in this book, uh, the friendship and the experiences we both shared as crime reporters, and and in different ways, understanding different parts of of what type of uh, world that uh, people can walk on the dark side of. Um, I spent a lot of my career down in the early days in the neighborhoods uh, that Williams was in. Um, My last high school was uh, less than two miles from uh, the house where his wife uh, still lives. Uh, My godchild was raised in Brighton where uh, Corporal Marie France Como was murdered. Uh, My career began in Belleville where Jessica Lloyd was. I worked in Trenton and lived in Trenton uh, back uh, 40-odd years ago working for the Belleville paper. Um, my father, my late father, uh, was an Air Force officer who got his uh, commission so this, there. So this was this was home for you? This had been home a long time, and, and I understood some of the things that went on. Um, also, I covered Jessica Lloyd's uh, funeral down in Belleville, and that gave me the, the one bit of exposure to the case that raised some questions for me as well. I guess the big question for the public, and Cal's kind of um, dealt with it, my guests are Ian Robertson from the Toronto Sun, Cal Miller, uh, formerly uh, of the Toronto Star, retired, uh, two great reporters. Their book is called How a Colonel Became a Killer, and you can uh, buy this on Amazon.com. And uh, Cal, you sort of said that the, the police really didn't have 
any sense of it or, you know, there wasn't really a fair opportunity for them to do it. Uh, I've got questions in that area because I know that's the number one criticism. Can you uh, explain that? Well, that was actually one of the criticisms that sparked the book because um, you wanted to know what really went wrong with the investigation. And when you examined each case, the the, uh, community itself didn't report all the crimes, particularly the break-ins. So there wasn't a linkage. The police were treating these as separate uh, incidents. And Williams himself was uh, changing his method of operation. So uh, it looked as though a number of people were committing different crimes. So there was no real uh, opportunity for the police to zero in on one person. So what was the the point when they were able to do that? Um, the real point was when they stopped his vehicle and uh, they matched the uh, the tire, uh, not by matching the tire, but the tire was similar to the uh, vehicle that had been parked near the Lloyd home when she was abducted. Now, was this guy, Russell Williams, that good? At, 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 at He could break into houses, but he seemed to be... He made a huge number of mistakes for yeah. the person who wanted to commit the perfect crime. You know, uh, the but, one thing that I, the, the, the number one mistake uh, that, that I noticed was that, and I, you know, I obviously interviewed, and she's been on the show, Lori Massacott, she may even be listening, it, it is like, you know, we're talking 100 feet from his cottage, and then the other uh, victim down the road, it was only less than a kilometer down the road. Uh, in Ottawa, if you look at the map, uh, all the break and enters, and this guy was out doing this stuff every night, uh, were all around his house. So, so I don't think he was quite this super uh, criminal. He was, uh, he was obviously some sort of a, a guy with a demon. He was a weirdo. He was an absolute weirdo, but also he had a very respectable position in the community, someone that uh, wouldn't be a suspect. Just like Jerry Sandusky down in uh, exactly. Penn State, although I know they're, they're different, but it, it does, the institution of Penn State, the institution of the Canadian military, and I want to get at you, because I have been a critic of the police and of uh, of the military, even though I, you know, as you know, I have immense respect for both, but, you know, you try to do the job, and I want you to defend this, and, and feel free, Ian, to dive in, too. Um, the one thing that I don't understand about the military is that I do not believe that nowhere in this guy's 27-year military career that there wasn't something that somebody noticed. How could that be? He was just an average person in in the military who didn't present himself in any peculiar way to... But he's uh, not average if you get to be name-based commander, so people are watching him. I meant as as an average. He's living an average life. Right, he had... uh, Rising to the rank of, of colonel. Yeah, and, and he had the over. wife, and, and you know, he, he was... Had a, he had a normal life. He also had this dark life that he was able to conceal. That just started a couple of years ago? He he wants you to think that. I have uh, an opinion that may have gone on a lot longer, but there's no proof of it. That's the problem. And could that fit into what your theory, Cal, is, is that he just he morphs into things? He's 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 escalated. Some, something may have triggered him. We were never able to identify that. Um, there was no real discussion uh, in the courts for his reason. It was ma- mainly paperwork that was presented. Uh, nobody really got to testify, and that was the sad part. I think one of the biggest things about uh, Williams that uh, confused people, particularly at the base and friends of his uh, in the more modern sense, was he was very, very separate in his two lives. He was the base commander at Trenton. He'd come up through the military and impressed an awful lot of people, and yet uh, he didn't live on the, the base itself. Uh, he didn't socialize outside the office the way a lot of officers over the years have done. He drove home to a very remote um, place in the, near the village of Tweed. Uh, there were homes nearby, yes, but he didn't socialize a lot. There were some friends, that, and his wife would come down from Ottawa. He'd go up there. And in Ottawa, although they had a bit of a social life, it was very separate. So you had, you had him as the officer, who was apparently a bit of a hail fellow well met to people he worked with. Uh, he would ask about people's um, uh, vacations, illnesses, uh, uh, plans for their birthday party. And some of those people were extremely surprised because here was this outgoing, reasonably charming person. He was even so well regarded that people later said, well, he was an improvement over some of the previous commanders we'd had. But he had this other side that he kept really well hidden. 416-872-1010, you can call on your cell phone, Star Talk 8255, and if you're down 
in this region, Trenton Region, one eight seven seven five one four five one five one. Ian Robertson from the Toronto Sun, Cal Miller uh, from the Toronto Star, how a colonel became a killer. A fascinating read. Uh, it really goes into details that uh, we couldn't do day-to-day as uh, media reporters, and what these guys have done is they've delved in, and they're trying to show... Uh, you're not trying to entertain in some ways, I noticed. You're just trying to say, here's almost like a forensic audit uh, of what this case is, and I think that that's a very important book. Now, I know that there's a buzz around the world about this book. Uh, tell me about that, Cal. Well, you've got it. It really is an audit, and uh, there's a lot of interest. The public have uh, a real quest to find out what made this person tick. Uh, and we talked about, uh, did he just start uh, when he began breaking in? Uh, we have Williams uh, in uh, the University of Toronto. At the same time, there were rapes going on in uh, Scarborough. Uh, the police have never been able to link him to any of those crimes. They have looked into them. There's, well, that's an interesting, no an interesting one because I did this story early on and it sort of fizzled out, and yet my source insists that he knew Paul Bernardo and that they went to Scarborough campus together and they crossed paths at malls and all this stuff. And it, yet I talked to Ken Bernardo, uh, Paul's dad, and he says that Paul says he doesn't remember him. But, uh, you know, it just, I mean, what are the, <laughs> the chances of, of two wackos like that being... Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, you've you've got you've got a homicide there as well. A uh, McWilliams girl who lived uh, in the same northern Ontario town that Williams lived in at one point, uh, being murdered in Scarborough while he was there. Um, coincidence is very interesting. Again, the police have looked into them. No, no evidence. And you also have somebody, uh, a woman who was killed at uh, CFB Trenton, exactly uh, years ago. And again, the police have. Uh, taken a look at that. They've also taken a look at William's movements around the world when he was over in Europe, when he was flying the Queen. And you know, in each of these places, there are crimes, and there's uh, women disappeared and everything else, including a third one named Deborah Rashot in, uh, was found in the Moira River. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back. You're listening to The Late Shift on In-Depth Radio, News Talk 1010. John Moore John Moore always introduces me so well. 416-872-1010. You can call us on your cell phone, Star Talk, 8255, long distance, 1-877-514-5151. Is that right? 514-5151. And uh, my guests are Ian Robertson from the Toronto Sun and Cal Miller, retired from the Toronto Star. Their book is called How a Colonel Became a Killer, and that's the story of Russell Williams and we haven't talked a little bit, of, you know, let's talk a, a little bit about his victims because, uh, you know, they often get forgotten in this. I mean, this guy's a, a become his, you know, his name's almost like uh, he's a, kind of a star in his own mind, I think. And, and, you know, a film star, all that stuff. He was one of the most vainest people. I'll tell you, when I was in the courtroom that first day and they showed those pictures and I've described it to friends, etc., anybody who's ever asked me, and it was like being on an airplane that was going crashing like everybody around us uh i mean that's how my sense of it was anyway that people were crying and and you know it was like it was really an assault to see those pictures of him wearing that lingerie and and this this guy you know I, we all knew i don't know what we were expecting but it just seemed to to really hit everybody there and i mean literally people were crying and reporters veteran reporters and i you know you guys know me i've i've covered a lot of things too and I've been uh, at some gruesome things, and I and I was hanging on too. It, and I remember when they took the break, and uh, you could just feel like the kind of the air let out of the room. They did it on purpose, uh, you know. So this is one of the most horrific criminals in our history. And the victims, tell me about the victims. Well, the victims are forgotten here. These are people that should not have died. These are senseless, senseless murders, and uh, the fact that. Williams has become a household word, and the, the two women that he killed are forgotten. We, in the book, we focus on them. Uh, we try to chronicle them. Mary life. France Como and Jessica Lloyd. Lloyd. And, of course, there's uh, other victims that uh, you haven't named. I don't know. Did you get into the Debbie Massacott? Uh, yes. Lori Massacott, I mean. Yes, uh, sorry. Lori Massacott. Did you talk to her in the book? I, I interviewed her uh, her last November. Uh, uh, she very graciously came down from Tweed to, what a brave to, to woman. Trenton. Very brave. 
Uh, very, very forthright. Um, the, there were two victims that survived uh, his assaults and his filmings. And according to the court officials, in neither case were these two women um, sexually assaulted to, to the extreme degree. Um, one, ha- her name is banned from publication and being spoken of in public, was a very young woman, young mother, uh, waiting for her, her man to come home from work. She had a See, baby. The problem, the problem with that, and I'm sure you cover it in the book, and I know we covered it in the media, is that that uh, Jane Doe situation happened. And like a Jane Doe here in Toronto, which, Kyle, you remember and, yes. and remember so well, they didn't tell anybody. And, and, and we're not here to pick on the cops because you can do that in every case. I mean, uh, it's just impossible. Uh, c- circumstances. It's just that our job is to report yeah, the, and not to not not to just to applaud everything. Yeah, there was there was an alert that went out, but it wasn't uh, that uh, the, uh, a woman had been sexually assaulted. It was it talked about a break in and and some interference. Yeah, but what they what they needed to do was, was a strong warning yeah, to the community. Right, yes. and and the other thing is that you know there's lessons that police have learned here uh, everywhere, and they always learn lessons in every situation because it's a hard job. But in that, there were a number of police officers that didn't knock on that door because it was the base commander. Exactly. And they focused on the guy next door. Yes. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if we can prove it, but the guy next door feels that uh, Russell Williams broke in and used his uh, winter jacket and, and his gloves and boots and things like that. That stuff all, all disappeared. So, you know, it was almost like he was trying to set the guy up. You know, it, it, it had that look to it. Even even where he placed Je- uh, Jessica Lloyd's body was uh, pointing suspicion to the neighbor. Uh, it's it's incredible. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about, uh, hopefully we'll get some calls as well. This is a good chance to talk to these guys because they've got a terrific book here. But we'll talk about the recordings and, and the, kind of the creepiness of it. You're listening to The Late Shift on In-Depth Radio News Talk 1010. 416-872-1010. You can call us, Star Talk, 8255, long distance, one 877 How a Colonel Became a Killer. And you can buy this book. A lot of people are calling in on Amazon.com. And, Cal, you were saying that there's a, a there's trick a, there. There's a link to the Canadian Amazon. And if, if you link on that, you don't get the book. You've got to actually buy it at the U.S.-based Amazon.com. And why would that be? I, I don't know. It's a ridiculous situation. If somebody's listening at Amazon, maybe you could fix that because a lot of people are listening here and may want to buy the book. But you can get it at Amazon.com. How much is the book? Twenty one ninety five. Yeah, and for twenty one ninety five, what you're getting here is, in a sense, like a coroner's inquest of what happened in, in detail. They're not trying to entertain you. It, it, it's, it's really shocking reading. And it's not for the faint of heart, but uh, it's very important reading. I think it, it almost reminds me of a bit of a like a university course, if there was one on this, where you get you know all it, it's a good resource that people will go to later. You don't have to dig through all the files; it's in your book. And I'm not saying the other books didn't have some of that because no. they, they they did too. We, but, we've actually recognized this. Yeah. And we, we've donated a number of books to uh, criminology departments across the yeah. uh, United States. I think I think that's a terif- terrific thing. Let's talk about the videotaping because uh, this is a key component. Obviously, Russell Williams uh, he taped and photographed meticulously everything. And he started with uh, the lingerie and he would spread it out. And it, I mean, this guy is so freaky and so creepy. Out of this right actually, out of a movie. This I mean, actually sets him apart from other criminals. He's the first person in the world to have ever photographed, documented video recorded and sound recorded crimes right from the start right through to his murders and they're horrendous people have talked uh, in the past uh, always talked about what they call snuff movies which are allegedly films made uh, either for for people to to buy and find some kind of perverse pleasure from or so-called real murder snuff films and until Williams came along, and Cal, I give Cal full credit for all using all his sources and in-depth sources of looking at criminals from around the world, pinned down the fact that Williams is the first known in the world to have actually done all of that. And it was from those recordings, both the visual and the sound, that the forensic uh, investigators, uh, the police investigators, psychologists, psychiatrists, everybody who was involved in the case and for future years will still be reviewing, gave 
an, an impossible amount of information into the depravity of a real killing underway. Okay. Uh, in the videos, uh, I he didn't kill them in the videos, right? Killed them in the videos. You see, you, you, you see, see that the actual homicides, and so and you see the victims begging for their lives. And and did he display that anywhere? Um, they were never displayed that we that we know of. That we know, yes. There's no indication that he posted. Where did they find? Internet. Where did the police find those? They uh, actually they were hidden in in his in his home. Now, that's the other interesting thing that so many people want to talk about all the time is that his wife, Mary Elizabeth Harriman, was back in Ottawa, and all the damning evidence was there. I mean, there was so much of it there. The lingerie and bags, uh, those uh, videos you described, at thousands point, of pictures. At one point, he had to clear out his house of the lingerie that was there and take it to a, a dump and, and burn it uh, because he had so much. He, he was filling the house. And she never tripped over any of this stuff? His life with the military was a total secret, and I guess he was able to say to her, this is my area where I keep my secrets, and you just don't go there. I, is that what, I mean, I military I, I mean, we're secrets? So, and, we're surmising. I mean, obviously, yeah. he had um, uh, If I said boxes. to my wife, if I said to my wife, <laughs> this area is secret, Should I mean, that's, that's, that's where she's going through. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, there's nothing that I can't, uh, that I could hide no, in, in, in I, my I'm home. No, the same way. Yeah. So, how could this be? I don't. I don't know. But I'm. I'm just surmising okay, let me, let me that he read, possibly let me, let me throw was able to convince you. her that he had a, a secrets in the military that she shouldn't be privy to. Let me. Let me come at it a different way. Um, is it possible there was anybody ever with him? Did he do all these crimes and shoot all these pictures all by himself? Is we've, it possible? We've never had any inkling whatsoever that he was anything other than a solo hunter. And so do we know that the camera, you know, was capable of doing these shots of himself? Yes, uh, and his movements that were, were portrayed on the video, you could see him moving from camera to camera because he had to use multiple cameras. And, and he used a tripod as well, of course. Ian Robertson is my guest, also Cal Miller, two legendary crime reporters, 416-872-1010. I think this is one of these things where people are listening and uh, they're not calling in, but you have a chance to do that. Uh, they're with me for a few more minutes. Their book is called... How a Colonel Became a Killer, and you can purchase this book on Amazon.com. And you know, the one thing that I that I wanted to talk about was the case of Jessica Lloyd and how they found the truck, Russell Williams' truck on Highway 37 was up in a farmer's field, and there was a copper who uh, came down and noticed it and went uh, to knock on the door. Tell us about that, Cal. Um, there was a police officer who observed the truck, and she went to the farm residence uh, and knocked on the door. Um, at that point, Jessica Lloyd was not home. She hadn't arrived home at that point. Williams was actually hiding uh, at the back of a field behind, in a back of a field behind her property. So he hadn't entered the house. Uh, the police officer found the property uh, vacant, nobody home. There was no sign of a uh, break-in at the home. She moved around to check it. Uh, she wanted to ask the owners of the property if they were aware of the truck, but the owners weren't there. So she didn't feel she had further grounds to go onto their property and go towards the truck. Uh, so she drove on. But she did mark down certain information about the vehicle. Okay. Did she mark down the license plate? She couldn't see the license plate from where she was. And she didn't go over. She now, didn't keep, go over. Keep, keep in mind, now, this is a very uh, a rural and, and dark, dark area in 37 at night. Highway 37 runs north from uh, Belleville uh, up uh, over the 401 yes. towards Tweed. And uh, so you could sort of uh, sense it. But I wondered if, and I've always wondered if there wasn't a blind eye turned, not to think that, that the colonel was involved in anything nefarious like he ended up being involved in, but perhaps maybe was in relations with this woman that maybe he met in a bar, knowing he's married, knowing he's a base commander. Uh, you know, maybe someone's turning a blind eye and thinking, <clears throat> that's, that's his own business. It's kind of a patent place uh, situation. Do you think that's possible? No, it's not possible because this police officer is devastated. She feels that she probably could have done more. She was commended by the Belleville Police Department for what she did. Uh, the chief said that the officer went above and beyond what 
police officers might do. But she didn't get the license plate. She didn't get the plate. So she didn't go above and beyond. No, no. I mean, she knows she should have gone much further, but she did more than what I. I feel bad for. Exactly. Uh, But she didn't get the license plate. No, no, and that's that's the sad part. And if it wasn't for uh, a couple of guys that were driving by who also noticed the truck, then Russell Williams is not caught because. No, he would have been caught because that was one of the big mistakes he made. He parked his truck. Where but they, they, but they didn't know that they didn't know that at the time. Not at the time. But after, the only reason they the know that was because these other guys came by and and pointed it out. No, no. The, the, when when Jessica, Jessica Lloyd was taken from the home, there were footprints leading from the backyard to the vehicle, so and they it, knew that that vehicle that was parked there, and the officer said that was. And there were two other passers by that. Gave descriptions of the vehicle. Let's take a caller. Uh, Ross, uh, I think this is uh, Ross McLean uh, from RossMcLean.com. Uh, Am I right? Yeah, it, it is, Joe. Hey, Ro- hey, Ross is a regular on my show, former Toronto police officer. I think you know these gentlemen uh, very well, Ian Robertson and Cal Miller, uh, from all your years of doing this thing. You're listening to the show. What have you got for these guys? Well, listen, I want to commend them on doing the book, first of all. And covering it as uh, you portray it, Joe, is certainly as being a forensic investigation into this. Because, uh, you know, I do a lot of work on sexual assaults myself and, uh, you know, for the prevention of them. And I think it's important that women know whenever they have any trouble from now on in from anybody stealing their underwear to the, the running, the grabbing, to just to report it so that we can get the, uh, the reports into the police. But my question for these two guys is, what's the similarity between the victims? Did this guy, Russell Williams, have a type? Not that we ever saw. In fact, we saw quite a, quite a variance in ages, in body types, in appearances, as much as they've ever been revealed to, to the public. Um, and one of the more chilling things is that not only did he go after mature women, uh, for instance, Lori Mazzucat is in her 40s, he went after Jane Doe, she was in her early 20s, but there is some pretty strong evidence that some of the underwear he stole was from uh, girls as young as 12 and 13. Well, and also, I just need to interject, is what he did do, he was in uh, the neighbor right next door in Tweed was a, was a child, That's right. in her room for up to six and seven hours at a time in her bed. And he also left a message uh, on a computer for a child in Ottawa. Do um, you remember that one? Um, so So... He was he left uh, a couple he, of messages, but there was one for an. But he was in he well. was in children's rooms wearing children's underwear, doing perverted things. I think uh, to answer a little bit of the question that Ross and maybe a little rhetorical, but it, but it, it seems to me that it, he was looking, and he even said in the one interview that he would look around see who was he was like hunting, and he was looking for opportunity. And these were single women uh, who were vulnerable at night, and he would break in ahead and look through all their pictures, know who you know what. Is it possible a man would become check the shoes, all that stuff? So he was looking for people, women alone, women, and the, women alone. The, and, and of course, uh, the children uh, have their parents. He break into their houses. Yes. Uh, I just don't understand uh, the range. Is I think what Ross is getting to, and this shows you just how scary this man is. And and you know, Ross, I'd like you to answer from your expertise on it. Do you think that there's something else that we're missing with this case? Well, I. I just to comment on your last comment there, yeah, myself, I found that there's two types of guys who get involved in these sexual attacks, and you nailed it. One is the type that, one of the ones that they go after a type. So they go after, you know, a blonde, a grenade, or whatever, like Bernardo went after the blondes, uh, for instance. And then the second type are the ones who just look for opportunity. They don't care who it is, so long as there's just opportunity there. So what you're saying is this guy was someone who looked for the opportunity. He well, did. A, he did actual reconnaissance on these cases, on these homes, to uh, pr- pr- to find the right opportunity for himself. And there's another thing too, guys. That, you know, he it's not easy to break into homes the way he did it with such uh, skill. And he did it. And he was an expert at that. And he was trained to do that. And I'm told that he was trained by the military to do that because they have a training program for for people to do that. Um, so there's an example. I remember uh, in this case where he was asked, how, why did you, you know, how did you get Mary Franz Como's uh, address? Uh, Jim Smith, the great Jim Smith, uh, asked him that, and he said, well, off the base roll. Yes. And I remember when I was up at the press conference and I asked the, the base, and of course they just, they gloss, oh, we're moving on, we're moving on, and say, wait a minute now. You know, the CEO of, of uh, Toronto Star, Toronto Sun, likes a pretty 
uh, girl that works down in the county. He can't just go and get her number. He's got to go through human resources. It gets logged in. You know what I mean? And so they need to change the, the culture there. And I think, I don't think that, I don't feel comfortable that the military has done anything. I love the military, but I really think that they've pushed this aside. They've transferred everybody out and they've moved on. And that's not right. He was able to access her personnel file. Now he's the base commander. That's right. But, but you know, it does raise a question, oh, sure. should this be allowed to happen again? And they haven't addressed that. Should be checks and balances. You know, a question for Ian there. Ian grew up in the area. He knows the area. I mean, I have to assume that's a bit of, uh, you know, a, a, a military town, and the military are always going into town there. So I assume that the military, just like we always imagine, are always getting into trouble when they go into town. Well, in my experience so, from having lived in Trenton, uh, the military was all over there, but in the counties around, some of them have co- uh, always they've been commuting uh, great distances uh, from homes that are rural in villages, uh, some of them within the city of Belleville. Yes, uh, they're all over the place, and they're, sir, like anybody else, uh, people in the military let off steam and, and can get into trouble. And sometimes, depending on what they've been doing, they, they, they do it in groups, you know, a whole bunch of guys and, and gals you'll see at a, at a local bar. That's, uh, that's part of life. Yeah, and, but my expectation of that, though, is what happens a lot of times, I'm sure the police must have gotten into a habit of when they arrest them or they deal with them, it's take them back to the base and let the base deal with them. So there must have been a bit of a hands-off. And yeah, you know, I, is the last thing I'll say on this before we take a break is that the other creepy side of it is is what, what Ross is getting at is that this guy had control of all of that, and he also even wrote a letter of condolence for one of his well, victims. So, in addition you know, to that, he had access to the police investigation yeah. through the military police. Yeah, the the OPP uh, were sharing, but they actually when they focused in on him, they cut off the military. Yeah, there needs to be an inquiry into all of this. You guys have tried to do it with your book, I think, and and that's that's a start. But I think there's questions that need to be asked. Uh, Ross, thank you for the call. It's always great to have you here on The Late Shift. And, uh, great work in the book, guys. Thanks yeah. very much. Now, we're going to take a break, and these guys are going to stick with me to the bottom of the hour. You're listening to In-Depth Radio, News Talk 1010.